Hello everyone, it is Joe. <sighs> it is raining gently right now. It's, uh, the forecast says it may rain the uh, rest of the day. I say may because I may manifest something else. And I'm learning not to use limiting language. So, <sighs> I want to offer you a new meditation technique today as well as discuss a little bit about my diet and some changes that I've made uh, based on advice from Barbara Waterhouse, a, I guess, co-pastor with her husband of the Center for Spiritual Living in Asheville, which is a very nice place. Anyway, um, meditation techniques. I was listening to an interview on Brandon Beecham's Positive Heads podcast, which I love and have recommended many times on this show. Um, Brandon was interviewing a gentleman, and I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, he had left a job in finance due to depression and anxiety and was finding success as a writer and a blogger for personal development and uh, he was recommending uh, meditation more than anything else he recommended you know diet which I want to talk about today he also recommended uh, you know not taking in all the drugs that we do in our culture from alcohol to caffeine to uh, sugar to uh, many others, and uh, that inspired me to think about uh, moderation and separating, uh, what do you call it, addiction from moderation. But first, the meditation technique. I uh, was listening to the show, and he mentioned, uh, the guest did, that he uh, enjoyed a uh, 10 minutes of meditation for 10 days. He felt that was a uh, good dosage or a good goal that would get a result. I think that's really the thing with goals. If you're going to set them, the trick is to set a goal where you're going to get a good result, you know, for the amount of effort and patience that you have. You know, if I say I'm going to do, um, you know, Let's say I'm going to do something that pays off in 30 years, you know. I'm going to do a little bit on it every day and it'll pay off in 30 years. And it'll pay off $5. Um, you know, say this habit takes, you know, half an hour to do each day and it's going to pay off 5 bucks in 30 years. Well, that's not a good payoff. I'll probably, you know, get frustrated at the low payoff and that how long I have to wait um, when we're beginners with something, we really have to acknowledge that, that we don't have experience or trust in the process yet. When I started camping out for a living and writing uh, for a living, I didn't trust it. I remember I crashed the second day I was out. Um, it just seemed too hard to find places to camp, you know, and I was really frustrated. I thought the whole thing wasn't going to work. Um, now I take it for granted that I will always find a beautiful place where nobody minds if I camp. And, uh, you know, that was a big change. Um, with my work, I'm learning to trust the ups and downs of my work. Um, and beyond that... I want to trust that when I write, when I talk with you, when I provide free content that will hopefully become more of a, you know, job <laughs> as I develop it in these early stages of just learning what I do best and how I connect with people best and how I can best provide the value that is me to the world, 
uh, as I do all of that, I need to remember that this is a process, that just figuring out what I like to do best, how I like to best connect with people, um, you know, where I get the best response, you know, those kind of early marketing tests, um, that idea of figuring out which channel or which platform or which approach works for me is, uh, it's just a phase I'm going through and it's a necessary phase for getting to where I'm going next. And there's kind of a Venn diagram where there's a circle of the things that I like to do, the things that other people respond to, you know, and maybe a few other circles. You know, um, I want to do something that's valuable to the world that other people respond to, but also that I feel really, really good about doing. That's why I like this show so much. Um, I reach out in other ways, music, art, um, blogging, uh, some Facebooking, you know, different ways, uh, talking with people in person, just people that I meet along my trip. Um, and all of those work in different ways. Um, I've discovered that talking with people in person sometimes leads to ongoing communication and contact. But uh, this video actually leads to the most um, interaction continuously with other people. So that's pretty great. I'm not going to give up talking to people in person because I really enjoy it and want to make that a part of my uh, journey. But yeah, I've been exploring all these different ways to do what I really, really, really want to do. I figured out a way how to travel for cheap. I figured out a way to uh, make some money online doing a job I don't mind doing that much. You know, that I'm good at, that pays well, you know, and doesn't require me to be settled down. So yeah, I like my job. It's just what I really, really want to do is connect with people on a deep level all the time. That's all I ever really want to do is connect deeply with people. And uh, that's always been my personality. Um, I like to connect verbally. That's my way. Um, and I'm finding ways to, you know, develop my social skills so I have more opportunities to connect with people. I've uh, had a couple really interesting uh, interactions in the last few days just... Uh, sitting with people, talking or studying, or kind of going back and forth between work and talk. Um, not like people who've met for the first time and maybe the only time who just chat and get to know each other as a novelty and move on. Because, you know, I have a lot of novelty in my life, so people like to chat with me once, get my story, stay in touch on Facebook, and that's about it. Um, and to really connect with a person and get to know them a little better, you know, maybe hanging out with them for the second time, or maybe that first time takes a different shape, you know, uh, gets a little more personal. So, um, yeah, I'm really interested in deep connections with people. I'm not much of a social butterfly. I have small connections with a lot of people, though I'm learning to do that, you know, to facilitate uh, deeper connections to, you know, to build trust with uh, social groups and all that in order to uh, reach out to people who aren't as eager as I am to connect on first sight. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'm really trying to make the point <laughs> with all of my analogies and all of my excuses to talk about myself and my own life, but I'm really trying to make the point that I'm learning to be patient and I'm learning to accept where I am today and my growth. I'm really willing to say that I need to be right here growing and learning these lessons until I learn them all up. And that's that. That's where I'm at. And nothing other than genuine, easy, slow paced patient honest effort will work uh, trying to jump ahead trying to be someone I'm not 
trying to impress people with quick growth. Those are all attitudes I learned as a kid to impress people that don't really serve me, and I'm letting them go. Goodbye. <laughs> so I'm learning patience. I'm learning that I'm on my way to all the things that I want right now, and that the best, best thing I can do is just put in an honest effort, which means not trying. It means not holding back. It means not succumbing to fear, but it also means not trying. It means just being myself in this moment and then being myself in the next one. And allowing the world, the universe, um, myself as a creator of this universe, um, other people, I guess, as deities who are helping to create my reality. I don't know how the whole thing is created. Um, I reject notions that there's an external creator or an external divine source that is somehow above us in an authoritarian way. I do accept the idea that there may be allies um, who are both stronger or less strong than I. Um, I know that we are both teachers and students. Um, but I don't see a divinity outside of myself that, uh, that I need to bow and scrape to. I know that's just human neediness for uh, validation that religious leaders have put on other people. And uh, it's hard because that's been nested into our idea of the divine, our idea of the big questions, our idea of the mysteries of life and the mysteries of ourselves. People have managed to weasel into there uh, the concept of less than. And that's not for me. So anyway, I guess I'm tangenting quite a bit, but I'm really trying to make that point about patience. Um, I was tangenting on the different types of God because... That's important to me uh, as an independent fellow. I like to uh, assert my value as exactly who I am and be open to those who know more than I do and to help those who may need my assistance if I know more than they do about something. But really keep it open. And uh, I love that idea of being both students and teachers. But, like I said, I'm learning that I am exactly where I need to be, and I'm going to be here as long as I need to be to learn certain lessons. I know that everything that I want in life and everything that I desire is there for me right now. It's just me allowing that change to take place in myself allowing myself to change into the kind of person who has those things i can do that instantly i can do that over many lifetimes um, it's up to me how much i allow my true self to exist how much i allow my uh what can i say Perfection, divinity, um, just open self, free self to come out. And, you know, it's a process. We'll see how it goes. And uh, there is no time. Time is infinite. We have as many lives, lifetimes other experiences who knows what's out there other than lifetimes there must be a lot of other games to play but we have many many different ways and means to open to what we are and there's no hurry i've always felt that i needed to hurry i think it's smart kid syndrome where if you push really hard and you hurry up and you jump ahead of everybody and you get the answer you can impress people and that's a form of validation, and we all love validation as humans. Um, we're pack animals, and we want to feel valuable to the group. And creating that within ourselves, just feeling that way 
without needing proof, without needing other people to say so, is really difficult. In this show, I enjoy talking, but I also enjoy knowing that there's someone out there who's listening. Um, that's a form of validation. That's a form of say, saying what I'm doing matters to other people. And I'm not sure validation is all bad, but I know that being addicted to it is. So that kind of gets me to my second point. Before I ever got to my first point, ah, I'm trying to talk about this meditation technique and I get off on glorious tangents. So uh, let me get to the uh, meditation thing first. Ah, okay. I was listening to the show. The guy was talking about meditation for, you know, 10 minutes a day, 10 days. You know, that worked for him. For me, I thought, hmm, meditation, I should get back into that. I should do more of that. Haven't done it in a while, like a good while. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And I thought about how I was going to do it. And I just kind of, you know, ran a bunch of ideas around in my head. Um, a little moment of inspiration, I guess. And figured out a fun way to do it. I love games. And... I thought it would be fun to gamify meditation a bit. Now, we need to set goals, like I said earlier, that are reasonable. If we set goals that are too difficult, we'll fail. If we set ones with payoffs deep in the future, we'll lose interest. If the payoffs aren't large enough, that won't be interesting for us either. Especially at the beginning of something, we need achievable goals that are small. If there's anything I learned from all the piano teaching I did, it's for people to set those kind of goals, to feel successful because people so easily feel bad when they make mistakes and the mistakes are a part of learning. The trick is to set it up so you try, you make a mistake, you try, you make a mistake, you try, you succeed, you know, to have the success come pretty often and not, um, not expect yourself to grow too much too quickly, but just celebrate each little step. So, I gamified meditation by meditating for a minute. I set a timer on my phone and I meditated for a minute. Great. Then I meditated for two minutes and I found that right at the very end, like four or five seconds before the end, I looked down to see how much more time I had. I got impatient and I looked down at the phone in my lap to see, huh, what do I have going on down here? How much longer do I have to do this? And, you know, I saw that I had a few more seconds left. And I restarted the timer, not at three minutes, but again at two. And that time I got through it without looking at the phone. <sighs> I suppose this technique could be used in a lot of different ways. I just kept going up three, four, five minutes um, and, you know, the idea was if I didn't look at the phone to see how much more time I had, I would jump up to the next level if I felt like it or just stop the exercise. I didn't know if I would stop at three or four or five. I ended up going to five. Um, I think, hmm, I don't have a great memory for these things. I'm pretty sure I got up to five. Um, there was some rain going on and I was hiding from it. Um, it was pretty light and I wasn't getting too wet, but eventually I came inside. The point is, it doesn't matter how, what I got up to or how much I did. Um, I think it was five. I think that was 15 minutes of meditation, you know, plus the ones that I didn't make that I got impatient on, which might get me up to around 17. So that was a pretty good amount of meditation. Um, another cool thing about this technique is you go for a minute, you go for two minutes, you go for three minutes. So you're turning the phone and the timer on and off a lot at the beginning of this process. So I found it was really awesome to get in and out of a meditative state, to feel myself going into some kind of meditation and then stopping, then starting over again, going a little longer and then stopping. And I would recognize in the three-minute meditation, some of the 
places I had gotten to in the two-minute meditation. You know, I could recognize certain, you know, visual phenomena, like I wasn't focusing my eyes. Um, I was looking at everything instead of focusing. I almost felt like a kid that, you know, children look at things openly and, and they may focus on certain things that are not what they're expected to focus upon but they may focus on uh, random things for me it's like the texture of a tree or the way leaves and branches look almost like a matrix when you unfocus your eyes you can see the whole forest and you're not looking with depth perception to look at one or the other but looking at them all of course for survival it's good to look at things and focus if there's a creature nearby or if there's a source of food nearby you want to focus on that and to look at things openly is something we do as kids but we're taught not to do it we're taught to focus we're taught to uh, you know look at the most important thing children and adults often have differing ideas of what's the most important thing uh, if they if and when children do focus on things, they focus on what they want to. A particular sensation, you know, a texture, a feeling, a, uh, you know, some visually interesting phenomena. You know, if I was a kid, I might be tracing the lines on my, uh, you know, uh, tarp here. I might be fascinating with these, you know, crazy camouflage lines. Um, as an adult, I could keep talking and have a video, though you know I love my tangents. So yeah, I felt some visual phenomena, I felt this childlike phenomena, especially in my uh, five minute meditation, I'm pretty sure I got up to five. Anyway, that's a technique you can try. Do a minute, do two, do three, do four, do five, do six. Don't get stuck on the idea of five or four or any number. I honestly think that the trick is to play the game as long as you want to. Just like you would any other. You know, if you're playing a game on your phone or in your computer or on a console, you'll play it until you don't want to play it anymore. And um, not to set any rigid goal for meditation. Uh, I really believe that it's something that we need to do because we want to do it, not because we're forcing ourselves to do it in the hopes that it's going to have some great result. Maybe the 10 for 10 thing works for you, maybe 10 minutes or 10 days, I'm going to commit to this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get results. Burr, 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 burr. Maybe that works for you. It doesn't work for me at all. <laughs> I do things when I want to do them because I love to do them, because I'm curious and experimenting with new things and loving and cherishing and nurturing old things that I love, things I've already discovered that make me happy. So, huh. Long story short, try the uh, meditation, you know, if you can get through a minute, try for two, if you can get through two, try for three. And you don't have to set the, uh, the rule that I did, that I'm allowed to go up to a greater difficulty, a greater number of minutes, if I don't look at the timer. Maybe for you, just getting through without standing up, you know, without stopping and Quitting the whole thing is enough. Um, to me, it felt right to restart if I didn't, uh, you know, feel the need to watch the clock. Um, maybe f watching the clock is too easy for you. Maybe there's a different challenge where you want to do a minute without moving. Uh, you know, you'll notice me here in the woods. I will move around. I'll smack bugs. I'll deal with little things that come up even as I'm talking, and that happens as I meditate too. You know, there's mosquitoes and ticks and chiggers and little guys to watch out for who I do not want to munch on my bod. So I am uh, in motion a bit <laughs> as I meditate. But um, if you find you're in a place where you don't really need to worry about bugs, if you're meditating indoors, um, maybe you find that not moving is something that you want to focus on or some other tangible aspect you know you if you're really experienced you may be able to identify certain thoughts you know like if i start thinking about my 
to-do list or if I start thinking about my job or if I start thinking about my favorite video game, I will restart. That's pretty advanced and I wouldn't recommend it for anybody as a beginner. Um, if you're a beginner and you feel tempted to make these perfect meditations right away, you're pushing yourself way too hard, you're going to burn out. Trust me, I've done it. Not just in meditation, but in a lot of things. So, those are my thoughts. Pick um, some kind of rule so you know if you've passed the uh, one minute, two minute, three minute test. But make it a rule that's really right for you. Not too easy, not too hard, and only you know what that is. And uh, resist the temptation to make it too hard. Um, if you're like me, uh, you'll, you'll have that hero complex of wanting to uh, prove yourself or do something amazing the first time out. Um, you know, as a desire for validation, as a feeling that we're not enough, that we're not good enough, and that we have to somehow prove ourselves that we don't just deserve to be happy just because we exist. So, good luck with all that. Um, the other thing, of course, I wanted to talk about was the difference between moderation and addiction. When we do things that we enjoy, we do them a lot, and sometimes they can go too far into addiction. Uh, whether that's drinking too many cups of coffee in the day, when one might be enough. Uh, me, personally, I, I typically don't drink much caffeine, but I will occasionally have a half-calf uh, if it's early enough in the day. I typically don't get to the coffee shop before noon, so uh, I usually cut it off around noon, but if it's still kind of early, I might have a half-calf, but those are pretty rare. I usually just go decaf. You know, there is caffeine in decaf, just not a lot. Um, that works for me. Um, for you, you may need a lot to even get an effect because you have, you know, consumed so much caffeine on a regular basis that uh, you really need a constant drip of it, you know, constantly consuming it. You know, you must, must just need it a lot. I've been through those places um, also remember that sugar consumption is a big part of, uh, coffee consumption. Um, and milk. I, I typically have, like, an almond milk or a soy milk, but, uh, I will occasionally have regular milk. I am not a strict vegan or vegetarian anymore, which is a big change for me. Uh, that confession or that transition is something I really wanted to speak out loud on the video. Because, well, I used to be completely, almost completely vegan and sugar-free. There was uh, bread. I was still eating store-bought bread, which had sugar in it. But I was otherwise completely sugar-free, um, free of animal products, and uh, really walking a very careful line. And that's changed for me in the last month or two. As I said, uh, Barbara Waterhouse from the Centers for Spiritual Living... Uh, she, hmm. she was talking about veganism and vegetarianism like that, you know, it's good to eat healthy and it's good to do those things. Um, at least this is what I got out of it. I, these aren't her words. Uh, but she was seeing it as that you need to eat what your intuition is telling you to eat in the moment whether that's a sweet, whether that's, you know, some cooked bit of animal flesh, uh, whatever it is, um, that what's right for you in the moment, you'll know it and you'll eat it. And I think that's really advanced because, of course, if I just say, hey, well, I really want a coffee, so I'm going to drink a coffee, and then I drink eight a day, which I've been known to do in the past, um... Or with alcohol, you know, you, I drink and then I drink more and then I say, hmm, I want to drink more. Of course, with alcohol, it's more dangerous because that drug turns off the parts of your brain that say, hmm, maybe we should stop. <laughs> so it's a slippery slope with alcohol because, like I said, the more, the more you have of it, the more you want to have of it. Um, you know, it turns off your inhibitions, especially your inhibitions to having more alcohol. So... That's a tricky one. That's one I'm not playing with right now. But um, I am playing with food. I am playing with, hmm, 
maybe if I have this piece of sushi or this milk in my coffee instead of almond milk, maybe that's right for me right now. Maybe that's what my body wants. And I still have strong feelings about why a vegan lifestyle is the way to go. And I'm still eating mostly veg- uh, mostly vegetarian, mostly vegan. Um, I'm having a very small amount of animal products and animal flesh. But I do think that there's something to the idea of enjoying what we want in the moment. The trick is, if we do too much of that, we fall into this addiction cycle. Like, oh, I love fried chicken. It's so good. It makes me happy. I'm going to have a lot of it. I'm going to have a bucket of chicken. I have had buckets of chicken in my past. (laughs) You know, I've been through that KFC phase. So, yeah. Is it right? Is it not? That's something we know in the moment. And like I said, it's advanced because I think if you have a problem with something, whether it's eating a lot of sugar or carbs and uh, being bigger than you want to be, or whether it's not eating enough and being smaller than you want to be, or whether it's uh, caffeine, sugar, alcohol, or even harder drugs. If you have a big problem with something, the best approach is just, just stop doing it completely. Basically not trusting yourself to do it in moderation. Like, hmm, okay, I'm not sure I can do this and avoid a bad result. You know, uh, whatever it is. Like I once had a thing for pizzas and I would get these $5 pizzas and I would eat them all, you know, in in an evening. I would eat as much as I could while it was still hot and then later on in the evening I'd finish it up. You know, maybe have another piece for breakfast if there's any left over, but I would eat a whole pizza and it would just mess up my digestion because we're not meant to eat that much pizza. You know, it tastes great and we love to eat it. And, whew, yeah, that was a problem. I've never had a really bad weight problem, but I have had some digestive problems just from eating, kind of binging on food. Maybe that's why I haven't had weight problems, because I've been lucky to have those uh, digestive issues. Who knows? But, uh, suffice to say, I quit my pizza addiction by not eating it at all. And... In some ways, it takes a lot of strength to just cut something out completely. But in other ways, it's easier. Because to have a slice of pizza and then stop would be much harder than, you know, just not having it at all. You know, because then I taste how good it is and I'm like, ooh, I want more of this good taste. And then I overdo it. You know, having a beer, you know, once or twice a week when I'm out with friends and not drinking at any other time sounds good you know but I know myself and I know that uh, (laughs) with that particular substance I can easily um, get overwhelmed and uh, just consume a ton of it so I'm not playing with alcohol right now I'm not saying I won't but I am playing with food and uh, feeling when it's right for me in the moment to have a small amount of something that I normally don't consume, of something that's on my, if not my no never list, my very, very, very rarely list, and saying, hmm, okay, I can have this, but I don't want to have it very often, and uh, maybe then, maybe then it'll work. Maybe it won't. Maybe I'll get hooked to something and have to quit it again. I don't know. Um, This also has to do with splurging on food. One of my favorite splurges is to buy expensive food. I'm surely the only guy who lives in the woods and eats sushi or drinks lattes, right? (laughs) I have a very interesting lifestyle. And with uh, with the money that I make, I can afford certain things. And I often enjoy splurges for food and drink... Uh, more than I do the idea of living indoors. I could live indoors and I'd have to pay some money and then I wouldn't have as much money for other stuff. Um, The last time I lived indoors, uh, 
there was a struggle between, you know, making money to pay the rent, but also having all the money I wanted to go out and be social and do all the stuff I wanted to do and do fun activities. Um, that became kind of a push-pull kind of issue, mainly because the place I was staying was uh, was a private apartment. I wasn't sharing with anyone, so it was more expensive. And I've learned that privacy is so valuable to me. I don't like living with other people. I love interacting with other people, but I want a place where I can go and no one is there. And people leave me alone. And I need to have that place. I need to have that privacy. And I can get that in the woods <laughs> for free. The funny thing is, as long as I have the privacy, I don't mind camping out. I love camping. Um, I love traveling. I love this lifestyle. So, uh, yeah, I found a different way to prioritize, prioritize my life. And, yeah, how much I enjoy expensive foods versus basic foods is also a kind of moderation that I'm working on. I think I'll talk about this more in other videos because that's really important to me right now of, you know, I don't want to consume so much expensive food on a regular basis that I create, you know, financial problems for myself, make work more stressful than it needs to be. But at the same point, I want to enjoy and indulge in the things that I love when I feel it. The real trick is when is it the universe telling you to give yourself a treat and really feel good? When is it good for you to have something yummy? And when is it not? When is it an indulgence? When is it damaging? When is it uh, an addiction? So that's the trick. Like, can we as humans draw a line that's not black and white? but say that I very, very rarely have this thing and I enjoy it when I do and I respect it as something powerful that if I have too much of it, I'll get stuck on it and overdo it and have health issues of some kind or another, you know. Or financial issues or social issues. There's different reasons that we <laughs> cut things out. But yeah, I'm really wondering about moderation and how to make it succeed. I've certainly made it succeed with coffee. I'll have a half calf once, twice a week, maybe not at all. You know, it's something that I can have once in a while that doesn't become a big issue. Um, or milk in my coffee. I'll occasionally have milk. You know, if I forget to ask for almond milk or if there's a big line and I don't want to get back in it or bug the person who's behind the counter or, you know, some kind of convenience thing. And I'm like, ah, forget it. I'll just do it this other. And I haven't found that putting in the occasional cream in my coffee has stopped me from choosing almond milk or soy milk most of the time. And that's really what it is. It's, is it a threat? Is if I do this once, am I going to keep doing it? Is it going to become a threat to good habits that I've built up? Or is it going to be just the occasional aside? So those are my thoughts. I still have a lot to think about with this. Um, but I do respect what Barbara said about eating consciously, eating intuitively, eating what we know is going to be good for us. You know, not picking up that fifth cup of coffee or that fifth beer because we know it's not good for us. Or we're pretending that it is. But picking up the occasional, you know, enjoyable thing... And the trick is we could have as much of that enjoyable thing as we want as long as it's good for us, as long as we believe it's good for us and not when we're doing it out of escapism or some other habit that's negative because that'll only make it worse. But yeah, I think it takes a lot of self-awareness to use moderation. It's almost like a third step. Step one is just do whatever you want and then discover the consequences. Step two is cut everything out that's bad. And then step three is moderation. Um and wisdom. And yeah, I'll keep you guys posted because that's something that's really important to me. Um, not just black and white rules, but like dark gray rules where it's like, hmm, I almost never do this, but when I do, it's enjoyable. Like those kind of rules. I think it's just part of growing up. I think it's maturity. And uh, I think it's exactly where I need to be. So, Enjoy the meditation trick. Let me know if that gamification works for you. 
Um, some of you will have the same personality as me regarding games and want to give that a try. For some of you, it probably won't be appropriate. Hmm, there's a creature crawling on my arm. Anyway, it's gone. And so am I. Thank you for listening to my show. My name is Joe Neely, N-E-E-L-Y. Go to joeneely.net slash community and check out all the places where you can connect with me and each other. Love you all. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.